my crazy. I'm actually going to pause the recording for a bit. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Now, if I go to presenter view, I want to make sure you'll see it. Okay. Now you're seeing just the presentation. From conflict to consent. I'm sorry? Yeah, from conflict to consent. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, one more thing I need to fix before we get started. Um, are um, captions enabled if participants need them? Just want to make sure that's available as well before we get started. But I don't think I can change it from the window that I'm in. All right, thank you all for joining tonight for um, tonight's session about conflict, particularly, I like to title this from conflict to consent, engaging with conflict to strengthen cooperation. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I know you all are familiar with NDCC's um, meeting rules, so some of this is redundant, but because of the topic of tonight's discussion, um, which will at points get very personal potentially for people and it's kind of building upon each section, it's important that people who are present for the whole thing are present for the whole thing. So once we get to the break, um, won't we won't be admitting anyone new into the meeting, but they can always watch the recording back, review the slides and resources. Um, but if anyone joins late, once we get started, I just ask that they kind of observe, um, you know, put any questions in the chat if they have them and we'll be sure to get to them. Um, but just wanna make sure that we're respecting the space that we're creating for everyone who is here tonight. Um, the other thing is there will be a break at some point um, just, you know, for folk to kind of take care of their needs, clear their heads, et cetera. Um, but then after that, we will continue straight through with the rest of the, um, workshop for this evening. Again, all the resources will be shared. Diana sent a message earlier with the resources that we'll be interacting with tonight in particular. Um, and then Ron already gave announcements about upcoming events and sessions for NDCC. Um, if you need to unmute at some point, uh, please use the space bar. It's the easiest way to quickly mute and unmute yourself. Um, and there might be points where I ask you to react. Actually, this icon is outdated. Now it might look like a heart in Zoom. Um, but if I ask you to react, um, it's to kind of like get a sense of you're here, you're paying attention, you're with me. Um, and then if you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like to share, you can always add those to the chat. Um, and if you would like to send something to me directly or to another person, you can either use the at symbol and select their name or you can send them a private message. Um, there is no Q&A able for tonight. So for the sake of um, queuing up questions, if you use the at and select my name and then put whatever your question is, I'll be sure to review them all and get to them at some point in the conversation. All right, so here's what I have for attendance thus far. Um, and this attendance role is also being utilized as a um, role for our round. So this will actually be the speaking order if at some point in the night I ask um, for folk to speak in order or to speak in a round. Um, and so please make a note of one, if you're the first or last person listed. Uh, so currently that would be Anita is the first person and Rick is the last person. Um, as far as, you know, participants in the cohort. Um, your screen and the is not full screen. So I can't see what you're saying. So are we supposed to be seeing what you're saying? Are, are you not able to see my presentation anymore? We can just see can see it, but it's not a full screen presentation. And what you're saying, we can't see it. 
You said here is the list. What list are you talking about? There should be names on the slide that says grounding attendance role. Are you not seeing that at all is what you're saying? That's correct. No. So you don't see any presentation at all? We Just see the, the presentation, slide. but it's not in full screen. What does that, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, sorry. Amber, we can just see the initial slide. Oh, so you're not seeing any of the slides I'm progressing through? No, no. Oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> um, let me try maybe, I don't know if I can refresh my share. Um, yeah, I don't know why that is. Um, anyone? No, what that, what could possibly be causing that? Any Zoom savvy folk in the room? I think what's happening is that you have shared your um your I guess this is PowerPoint. You've shared your PowerPoint and you're not mm -hmm. sharing your PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So let me stop sharing then and do a new share. Share screen. Okay, here we go. All right, now you're seeing what I'm talking about. Okay. Yes. All right, perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, it looks like Rick is rejoining. Okay. So the current speaking order, um, like I said, starts with Anita, ends with Rick. Um, but please make note of whoever is in front of you in the speaking order and whoever is after you in the speaking order um, for the sake of rounds, because there are a lot of people. Um, it'd be best if folk can just remember whose names are in front and behind them. All right. So I want to kind of just briefly hear from you all um, because we got started a little bit later. Um, please try to keep it to under 30 seconds if you can. Um, but just I want to hear like, what are your names? Where are you joining from? What organization are you part of? Um, enroll if you have one with the organization. And then um, just one word for how you're showing up tonight. Um, so again, my order, the first speaker would be Anita. And then when you're done, just pass it to the next person. Anita? Like you're talking. Miss Anita. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yep. I can. Yeah, okay. I had to plug in a mic. Um, yeah, so I'm Anita Shervington. Hi, I'm based in Birmingham in England. Uh, the organization is called Blast Fest, which spells out Black Life, Art, Science and Technology. And we are a pop-up festival and a community engagement platform that fuses science, arts and, and Black culture. I can't see the rest of, um, you know, the screen with the prompts. Uh, is, is, is that enough? Yeah. Have I said everything? Just or one word for how you're showing up tonight. Well, it's uh, something like 11, it's, it's, it's late here, nearly half past 11 at, at night. So I'm tired, but always um, eager to, to learn from all the speakers as part of this program. So I, I'm feeling um, energized in that sense, but also looking forward to going to sleep. <laughs> <afterwards>. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Okay, thank right. you. Um, Antonisha, I think, is next. We can't hear you very well. You sound a bit far away. Antonisha, New York. There we <laughs> Syracuse, go. New York. You can hear me now? Yep. And um, my group is working on a community and BIPOC farmer owned um, cooperative in Syracuse. Um, we don't have a name for it quite yet. We're still working on that. And how I'm showing up is eager to learn. 
And I guess mm -hmm. I'll pass it to Johanna. Or Carolyn is next on my list. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Hi, it's Carolyn from Littleton, North Carolina. And I'm the executive director of the Ella Baker Educational Project of North Carolina. And I'm showing up this evening good tired because today uh, I held a workshop as well, Democracy in Action. And uh, it was focused on cooperatives and its democratically governed methodology. It was a good session. So I'm, I'm a little tired, but a good tired and looking forward to um, listening to what's being offered this evening. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Carolyn. All right, next I see James. Hi, um, my name is James Framboy. Um, I'm the chief of staff of community and culture um, with the Boston Juma Project, um, but I'm based in Philadelphia and I am showing up um, tired as well. Just had a long day of work um, and been running around sort of uh, doing some errands. So I'm just a little tired, uh, but I will pass it to Joanna. Hi, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Joanna Dorsey. I'm calling in from uh, New York. I work with Black Farmers United of New York State, and I am showing up energized. Um, I'm sorry, eager. That's the word I want to use, eager mm -hmm. to learn um, and to take in what these uh, sessions have been really good thus far. Um, so each week it gets better and better. So I'm just eager to learn um, and take this information and um, dis disseminate it within um, the communities that I'm a part of. And I'll pass it to Joshua. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Kroom. I also am with the Boston Eugema Project based in Boston. And yeah, to your question, Amber, feeling, again, very excited to reconvene with the group and um, join in with the topic for today. And with that, I will pass it on to Kendra. Hi, I'm Kendra Klein. Um, I'm in Athens, Georgia with Hive Mind Community Investment Cooperative. And um, I, like many others, I'm tired. I um, served on a grand jury today. So um, I was in court all day, but this is going to be a, a nice reprieve from you know, being in a courtroom and hearing upsetting things all day. So I'm excited to be here. Karita. Hi, I'm Karita Steverson. I am from Warrington, North Carolina. Um, I am, I'm going to say energized because I attended Carolyn's event today. Um, ran home to get the inflatables for a Razor for our cooperative, our food co-op, the front porch for tomorrow, and I'm now in class. So happy to be here. Um, Marcia. Is Marcia still with us? Oh, sorry about that. I'm Marcia Barnes, and I'm from Bloomington, Minnesota. I work with the Lotus uh, Healing Sanctuary, sanctuary uh, and I am showing up as very new. I am just a new babe in the woods. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, uh, when Annette invited me to um, explore this, I said, yes, but uh, I am very young babe in the woods. Al although today is my birthday, I feel like a newborn. So happy birthday. Uh, yes, happy I'm birthday. showing up as a newborn and ready to learn. And I know it's going to take me somewhere uh, where I want to go. And um, thanks for having me. Gosh, and thanks for being with us on your birthday. Yes. Um, Best it's a good it's a good present. Uh, Marie, I'll pass to you. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Um, this is Marie and Doris Ray. Uh, we are the founders of what we currently call the Tax Cooperative, and uh, we're fledgling, trying to understand membership. 
um, and how to get new members. Uh, um, we're here in Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, and uh, we're showing up committed to, um, you know, integrating this way of communicating into our into our already professional skills. So we're very committed to being here, which I guess would make us energized, definitely. And I'll pass this to Naima. Hello, um, I'm Naima. I am, I am in the DMV area in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm not really sure what everyone... <laughs> I'm sorry, my I just picked up my children from school and uh, we had some things happening along the way, <laughs> but uh, accidents and whatever. But um, uh, yeah, I'm I am happy to be here and to learn, and I think um, I'm excited for this topic. And then the the rest of the prompt was what what group are you joining from, and what's one word describing how you're showing up today. I'm joining from um, ASL Garden, uh, excuse me, excuse me, and um, how am I showing up today um, with an open mind? Um, that was Naima, so next we have Paulette. Hi, Paulette in Birmingham, UK, um, a part of Blast Fest. Um, I'm showing up tired. I've been to line dancing classes. I taught some yoga this morning and I'm fasting. So I'm just tired, but I'm really happy to be here because I'm finding this, um, the information very interesting. And somebody's already approached me to set up a yoga cooperative. So it it's kind of sits within what I'm doing and also the work that I'm doing with Blastfest. Just happy to be here. Um, next we have Ramona. Ramona. Good evening, I'm Ramona Hassan. I um, am from Atlanta, Georgia. The organization I'm with is called Market 166. It's um, We are planning a food co-op and one of our key things is to uh, get fresh vegetables and fruit from the urban farmers uh, in our area where we plan to put the the, the store or um, if we can find a location that would be suitable for a store. I am an owner. We have no members. Everybody is an owner. And uh, I'm really um, very curious about tonight. Okay. There's one one more thing on there and I didn't get it all down. No, that was good. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, next we have Tamika. Tamika? All right, and I'm here, Tamika. Um, what about Deborah? Oh. Okay, yes, this is Deborah Hargrove. Deborah. I am with uh, Market 166 also in uh, East Point, Georgia. Um, I come uh, for hope, <laughs> hopeful, uh, because um, the like the title says, uh, from conflict to consent, um, I'm, I'm trying to be more hopeful in where we are right now. Um, I am somewhat of the core uh, for our co-op, uh, connecting the past five years with the next three years and trying to uh, convince new owners that uh, our store will be delivered in the next two years. Uh, people are right now at the wait and see mode. Although we have 400 owners, um, the people that I, I, oh yes, I am chair of the uh, ownership and outreach committee. 
So I am out there um, connecting with the community, trying to uh, embrace new stakeholders. And uh, people are somewhat a lot leery in uh, committing, you know, because uh, our goal has been pushed another two years uh, to the future. So I'm hoping that I can get um, some more, um, <clears throat> something to uh, resolve some issues that are currently uh, in the in the midst. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for being with us, Deborah, and sharing. Um, next we have Denise. Hi, I'm Denise from Birmingham, England. The organization is called Amory Artists. We support early stage music artists and other creatives. And I'm sure enough interested and very eager because I've been dealing with a few conflicts in the team that I work in, work with. So um, I'm really looking forward to taking what I learned today and using it with the group, with our, with our team. Wonderful. Um, and next I have Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Welsh. I'm a uh, faculty in sociology at Syracuse University, and um, I'm helping Antonisha and others uh, establish a farmer-owned food cooperative in the city of Syracuse. And uh, I guess I feel gratified to be working with Antonisha and others and to be part of this group that is uh, so committed um, to what they're doing. Exciting. Um, my sister uh, graduated from Syracuse University, so it's cool to hear that there's some co-op energy moving in Syracuse. Um, thank you all, everyone, for joining. Thank you for those of you joining from the UK really late at night. I'll try to keep that in mind. <laughs> try to keep the energy up for our time tonight. Um, thank you all for participating in this check-in round, um, I'd like to know who's in the room, who I'm talking to. And so with that, I will actually, um, oh, did the recording start again? Well, never mind on resuming the recording, but yes, our topic for tonight is from conflict to consent. And um, we're here to really talk about how we can engage conflict in a way that strengthens our cooperatives. Um, so who am I? Ron gave my bio. I won't go too far into this. Um, but I don't like to always think of myself in terms of like professional experience. I'm a person first. And who I am as a person informs a lot of what I do and why I do it. Um, uh, both parents uh, descend from formerly enslaved folk lineage from North and South Carolina. I did do my ancestry. African ancestry test. So I found out um, which, you know, nations we come from, from the continent. Um, and my start, like early, early start in life was as an organizer at the time, did not know that was what I was because I was a child. And um, I was exposed to a lot of things that I ultimately got to do professionally um, through my career, but in a more community oriented lens, being someone that you know, comes from East Baltimore, lived in West Baltimore for many years, and um, got to experience firsthand many of the challenges um, that developers come to supposedly help resolve, but um, sometimes uh, isn't always the case for the most uh, vulnerable and impacted people. That's also why it's important for me to acknowledge um, whose land I'm on. Um, and so the land that I'm on was originally stewarded by the Piscataway Susquehannock people of Turtle Island, which we know is the United States now, but um, also many generations of Black and Indigenous folk and low-income folk who have migrated to and from um, this area, either by choice or by force. Um, so it's important for me to always remember that history and lineage, especially the part of Baltimore that I'm living in, which has had so much turning of... Um, groups of people over the years. I always like to anchor cooperative conversations and cooperative principles. And in your groups, 
it's important to do the same. Um, since most folk here are already cooperators or members of co-ops, you're probably quite familiar with these principles. Um, but the part that we often don't recite, which I think is equally, if not more important, is the 10 cooperative values. And I think these values are especially important when we're talking about the culture we want to set within our co-op and how we want to engage conflict with each other. Um, things like being responsible for ourselves and each other, um, helping ourselves and each other, caring for each other, uh, speaking with honesty, openness, um, having a lens on equality and equity um, and democracy. And then, you know, ultimately working towards solidarity. We're all in this work um, because we want to be here. And it's important to remember that, um, especially as we're engaging with conflict. So I want to affirm that tonight, I will do my best to uphold the cooperative principles and values during our time together um, and always. So if you all agree, if that resonates with you as well, and you want to help uphold these principles and values, uh, you can use the reaction, uh, give me a thumbs up or a heart, something to you know show solidarity with these principles and values. This is something else that is very important. And so I introduced this graphic in the slide. So if you haven't taken any deep breaths today, I invite you to do so right now. You can follow the circle as it uh, goes from inhale to exhale. But I wanna emphasize the importance of breathing because breathing helps to activate the vagus nerve, which controls our parasympathetic nervous system. This is the part of our nervous system that oversees our mood, our digestion, our heart rate. Um, it also helps, breathing helps us to uh, send oxygen to our brain and our other organs. Um, so what that means is that when we deep breathe, we are helping our bodies to recover from things like anxiety, depression, stress. We're also helping ourselves to focus. It also helps us to improve our sleep patterns. And these are all things that are very important um, for how we show up in space. And when we're in a conflict mode or when we're in a distress mode, remembering our breath before we react so we can actually choose our response um, is very key. So there will be another point at the night where this slide will come up, but I just want to always encourage us to remember our breath. Our learning objectives. We will be defining conflict um, and understanding some of its root causes. Uh, we also will hopefully develop an appreciation for the benefits of healthy conflict within groups while being able to recognize the conflict and trauma responses in ourselves and each other. And we will hopefully be introduced to some new tools that we can implement both personally and within our co-ops um, in order to engage in conflict more cooperatively. And this agenda is all throughout all the slides. Um, but this resource, uh, if you scan with your phone or go to this link, which again, everything will be shared afterwards, there's even more stuff than what I'm actually going to cover tonight. Um, but I want it to you all to be able to walk away with as many tools as possible, not too much to be overwhelming, but enough that you can take it and apply to your group. So what is conflict? This definition in particular comes from a great resource called In It Together. Uh, which was compiled by, in partnership with um, Interrupting Criminalization and Dragonfly Partners. But essentially what conflict is, is someone's needs are not being addressed. Um, on the surface, it might look like an argument, it might look like a disagreement, but at the end of the day, conflict is occurring when someone's needs um, are not being met or they feel like something they need from the other person they're not able to get. And a lot of times conflicts arise from a mistake or miscommunication, um, which ultimately then leads to the consequence of someone's needs not being met or feelings if their needs are not being met. So um, that's important to remember. A conflict is an expression of a need or a surfacing of a need. And it's our job to kind of unpack it and figure out what that need is. And we'll explore how we'll do that later tonight. There are three general types of conflict. Um, there are the conflicts that happen inside of us or intrapersonal. There's also the kind we're probably most familiar with, which is um, interpersonal conflict between multiple individuals. 
Um, but the one that I want to highlight and emphasize tonight is unconscious conflict, because this is the type that occurs beneath the surface. And this is caused going back to those needs, right? So unconscious conflict is caused by suppressed feelings or needs. And it often occurs when surface conflicts are not adequately addressed. Um, so this is the type of conflict. Well, I would say this and interpersonal um, are important to be mindful of as we are um, interacting with each other, as we're running into tensions with each other within our groups. Because a lot of times we're not even aware that we have a conflict or we have an issue, or we're not aware that the other person, you know, might be thinking something or, you know, wrestling with something. So the more space we can create to have those conversations, to bring those things to the surface, the easier we're able to actually engage and overcome those challenges. Um, so I have a couple of examples here. I won't get into it into the, in the interest of time, but um, for example, cognitive dissonance is a form of intrapersonal conflict where we're, you know, kind of distressed by new information or things that disrupt our existing pattern of thinking or beliefs. Then there's conflict of interest, which can be intrapersonal or interpersonal, but often comes up in groups or organizations. Um, and there are very like legalese ways of defining this, but essentially means you're juggling between um, maintaining the interests of whatever group you're representing and your own interest um, is normally what a conflict of interest entails. So what are some of the benefits of healthy conflict? Um, it helps us to, it helps to provide new information. It helps to increase our flow of communication with each other. Conflict can also help uh, to form new collaborative alliances that we didn't know were possible or there. Um, it encourages our creativity and innovation and helps us to build trust and understanding with each other. Conflict also can facilitate growth and learning within our groups. Now, what most of us are probably more familiar with is unhealthy conflict. And that's essentially the opposite of what I just described. So it distorts or withholds information decreases our flow of communication, creates new silos and factions. Um, it discourages us from bringing our most creative and innovative selves uh, to spaces. It also can erode or destroy trust and understanding that was once built. And when our uh, trauma or you know past experiences have been triggered by a conflict, it can actually cause regression in our growth. So we wanna stay as far as possible from this unhealthy side and move towards the healthier side of conflict, if we can. Um, there are five primary conflict response modes, and this model comes from a gentleman named Thomas Kilman. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side in the graphic, these are um, modes that exist on like a spectrum of least to most assertive and also least to most cooperative. Now we're here tonight um, for a co-oponomics academy. So ideally, we would try to stay on the more cooperative side of conflict responses. But what I do want you to um, know and take away from tonight is that um, there is no wrong conflict response. It just might not be the most advantageous for the particular situation. So there might be a situation where, for example, competing or avoiding would actually be the most appropriate response. However, if you are working towards being more cooperative, um, maybe avoiding or competing is not the best option to choose in that moment. Or if you're trying to be more assertive, maybe accommodating um, isn't the best option to choose in that moment. So. It's really important for us to know what we're trying to accomplish and therefore be able to choose the response mode that makes the most sense. Now, um, hopefully our tired folk, um, we can get some energy behind this particular activity. Um, so in one of the resources that Diana sent you all was a self-assessment. Um, it's best to open this particular document in Excel if you can. Um, but if you take about five minutes and answer the 15 questions, um, don't overthink it. Uh, but I want you to be able to identify what your two highest conflict response modes are or your two most frequent conflict response modes are. And this is going to be important information for as we get into more of the content later on.
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set our five minute timer. And when it's done, we will continue on the rest. Sorry. No. So now let's talk a little bit about trauma and how this all ties back into our conflict response modes. Trauma is the experience of a very stressful, frightening or distressing event that is difficult to cope with or out of our control. It could be one incident or an ongoing event that happens over a long period of time. But essentially what trauma does is it rewires our brains and shapes how we process new experiences. So when a traumatic memory is triggered, we often seek safety by reacting in ways that have provided us relief in the past. Now there are um, four primary conflict response modes. I think I've seen something before where there was a fifth one, but for tonight, we're gonna discuss the four, um, which are fight, um, or responding to the threat with aggression, flight, or running away from the threat um, for self-preservation, freezing, which is basically just shutting down and dissociating um, for immediate relief, and then fawning, which is submitting or obeying um, because it feels safer than either fighting or fleeing. And so you might already be making this connection, but there is a correlation between the conflict response modes and the trauma response modes. Particularly, if you have trauma around conflict, your default response modes might look very similar to one of the trauma response modes. Um, so this is why it's very important to be aware of our own story as it relates to conflict and be able to reflect on that story um, so that we can use that information to help us um, better navigate and choose how we respond in the moment. Um, again, going back to that breath, taking a beat, taking a breath, um, being present in your body to understand how you're feeling and what might be coming up for you is important um, because as we're engaging with that conflict, again, we want to make sure that we're choosing the response that is most appropriate and that moves us closer towards the goal that we have in mind for that particular relationship or that particular situation. Now, I did want us to do some journaling and sharing, but I'm going to ask that you do this in your own personal time in the interest of time. Um, but uh, spend some time with yourself um, really processing and trying to make sense of your own personal conflict story. And um, when you have a moment, you know, take about five, 10 minutes and just write down your thoughts about what your typical immediate response to conflict is. And then how might that response actually um, be correlated to trauma that might exist, whether it's personal, um, you know, within your personal life, your family life, uh, your friendships, your work relationships, your community experience, your cooperative experience. But it's important to know like kind of what that history is and how that history has perhaps uh, affected the way that you navigate uh, situations of conflict. Um, so if you can think of some specific examples that will also help um, to, to kind of illustrate in that in your mind what that is for you. And I encourage you to do this with your co-op as well. So the people who aren't on this call that you might be working with, that you might be getting to know, take some time to really look at your own individual conflict stories. And if you can share what you feel comfortable sharing with each other as a way to build empathy and get to know each other. Now, this is something that I did with a, a group that I've been meeting with for about a year now. Um, and we had a conflict situation that arose which caused us to pivot and do a whole workshop about conflict. 
But after doing this exercise, um, we all felt like we kind of knew each other a little bit better and understood each other a little bit better. I certainly felt like I understood um, my colleagues better, my comrades better, so that when things were coming up, I wasn't internalizing it or personalizing it. Again, going back to my own trauma responses. Um, but instead, I was able to navigate it with a little bit more empathy and understanding. So highly encourage you to engage the exercise with your co-op. Um, the ways that we respond to conflict are informed by our experiences with conflict from birth to now. But once we are aware of our stories and our options, we now have the power to choose our responses based on what best serves our needs and ultimate goals. Um, we also have access to tools that many of our ancestors and elders didn't to help us navigate conflict in healthier ways. So it is up to us to use these tools to create new conflict stories for ourselves, for our families and our communities. Um, so that, again, that deep breathing, so important, so, so important. Um, I wanna hear from folk in the chat. How are you feeling? It is currently 7.04. So I did have a five minute break planned in here, but I know some of our UK folk again are tired. So um, I just wanna see in the chat how folk feel if they wanna take the break or if they wanna go right ahead and continue with the rest of the um, presentation. Okay, I'm seeing keep going. I'm gonna need a few more. <laughs> okay, continue, keep going. All right, a couple more people keep going. All right, continue, go, great. Okay, so it looks like most of you wanna keep going. So we're gonna keep going with the rest of the presentation. Um, I did have for the break, this song, um, which is one of my favorites. Uh, if you're not familiar with Jim and Nell, uh, she has an album called Mantra Loops Volume 1. I think there's a Volume 2 as well. But this particular um, mantra, I forgive myself and I release, I think is just so important um, when we're kind of processing and unpacking trauma and our relationship to conflict. Um, so yeah, encourage you to look that up and listen your own time. Now, we've talked about definitions of conflict and the five conflict um, styles. Before I continue, because um, we skipped through our break, I just wanna see if there are any questions about what we've covered thus far. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any, but if anything comes up, please again, use the chat. I will continue. So it's important that our groups have shared agreements that kind of keep us on the same page about how we want to engage with each other, um, what values you want to uplift, what practices you want to uplift when we're in space together. Um, so normally, when you are working on shared agreements in a group, you would present anything that was prepared. If not prepared, you would ask folk to contribute to the list. And then you would do a first round to ask people if they have any additions or edits, followed by a consent round um, so that people can, you know, agree to these as they are agreements um, that we're essentially committing to together. Um, so some of the agreements that I think are particularly helpful for conflict, and these come from uh, resources prepared by organizers and folk that have done this work for many years, but um, committing to self-transformation, embracing different ways of being, act with integrity, approach with curiosity and inquiry, and own our intentions and our impact. Um, and that last one's important because a lot of times we might not intend to cause harm or we might not intend to hurt someone's feelings or we might not intend to overlook someone's needs, but it's the impact that the other person is feeling and responding to. So it's important for us to own both our intentions and our impacts um, when engaging with each other. Common sources of conflict. This is just my list, but there are 
other lists out there <laughs> um, as well, but broken or missing agreements, uh, informal power structures. If folk aren't familiar with, or you may be familiar with um, feminist organizer, Joe Freeman, she has a great um, article that she wrote about being a part of the feminist movement in the seventies called Tyranny of Structurelessness. If you've never read that, I highly recommend it. Um, it talks a lot about informal power structures and how they affect the ways that, you know, you know groups function. Um, but knowledge or skill gaps, you know, people are kind of coming from different um, areas or points of view. Um, people are coming from different, um, you know, prior experiences. So some people might have knowledge about certain tools or skills that others don't. And that can create a sense of conflict um, as well within the group. Again, going back to those unconscious conflicts, those unaddressed tensions that we're not resolving or working through adequately, um, those unmet or unmatched needs um, that exist within our, our group members. Um, Antisocial behavior, someone just does something wild and it's like, wow, you know, that was, <laughs> that was offensive or that was, you know, unnecessary or what have you, but things happen. You know, sometimes we have moments and that can cause conflict as well. Um, a lot of times we also have internalized narratives that we're bringing. And when something happens, those narratives are triggered and they're affirmed, you know, especially if those narratives are negative or um, things that would have us lean away from instead of towards engaging with each other. Um, and then again, you know, those trauma responses, avoidance, not wanting to deal with the issue. Um, because we don't want to have more conflict, right? We think that we can actually prevent conflict by avoiding it, but we're actually not. We're causing it instead. And much of our sources of conflict boil down to three main areas. It's something in communication, it's something with our beliefs, or it's something with our behaviors. Um, so when we're trying to kind of unpack and identify where conflict is coming from, you can think of it in those three frames, or you can look at this list. Um, to try to figure out then how to respond appropriately to the situation. Now, um, practices or ways that we can avoid conflict, don't. Again, re-emphasizing that we have to engage with conflict. Avoiding it just causes it to fester and uh, grow over time, which is what we don't want. And this particular quote comes from Paula Atkins, uh, one of the authors of Pro Social. Conflict is normal and inevitable in any high performing group. So if your group has no conflict whatsoever, I would question what you're actually doing. <laughs> because when we're really doing the work, things are going to come up. So rather than avoid, let's engage. And what are some ways that we can engage with our conflict? Invest time in building relationships. Don't try to rush everything. Move at the speed of trust. Um, take time to learn and study together. You can read books together. You can do trainings together, such as this one or others. But the more that you um, share in the experience of learning together, the more you have a common language and common you know, resources and tools that you can tap on when situations come up in your co-op. Um, also, try your best to use consent or consensus-based decision-making for major decisions. Now, little everyday mundane things, um, that would get really <laughs> redundant and time-consuming if everything had to go through a consent process. Um, but when it comes to major things that have the need to impact everyone, it's important that everyone has the opportunity to weigh in and buy in to whatever the decision is. And we're going to talk a little bit more about consensus um, later tonight as well. Uh, you also want to review and refine your policies and shared agreements often. Don't let them collect dust. Don't assume because you agree to them at one point that it's stagnant and that you'll always agree to them or that they'll always meet your needs. Um, especially when things come up, that's a great opportunity to review them. But you also want to schedule review periods at least once a year for all those types of things. And then if you don't currently have a conflict and grievance policy, create one or adopt one that already exists. There are lots of great examples out there online and I've linked some of them in this presentation or referenced some of them in the resources, but adopt something and try it. 
um, see how it works, put it into action, practice it, right? And then if you find that you need to make adjustments uh, based on things that come up for you or things that are specific to your group, then you have the ability to make those adjustments because you at least started somewhere. What you don't want is to be in the middle of a conflict and you have no policy whatsoever. So be proactive about that. And again, goes back to the three main areas, communication, beliefs, and behaviors. Um, one of our conflict practices, consent. Um, many of you may already be familiar with this or be practicing either consensus or consent decision-making in your co-op. So I won't belabor this too long, um, but this definition comes from Spring Up. And consent is a practice to collaborate equitably across difference. Essentially, it is uncoerced agreement that a proposed action is good enough for now and safe enough to try or within the group's range of tolerance. Um, so when you agree to something, it's not because I like it, it's my favorite thing in the world, but I'm okay with it. It's not gonna hurt anything if we move forward with it. Um, and when you're consent building within your co-op, you're working to expand your collective range of tolerance, taking into account the entire group. So everyone comes with their own preferences and range of tolerance, but together you have quite an expansive range of tolerance, hopefully. And so the more you build trust with each other, the more you build understanding with each other, the more that range of tolerance will increase, hopefully the less objections you'll have and the better you'll get at actually crafting proposals um, so that you can move through the approval process more quickly. Now, this particular model of um, consent-based decision-making process comes from Round Sky Solutions. There are other models out there, including one from Sociocracy for All that folk might be familiar with. Um, but these are just the steps for this particular process. But you start with the proposal, either something that emerges during your time in a meeting or something that's prepared before the meeting. Um, then you make sure you open up a round for people to ask any questions or make any comments on the proposal. At that point, you can then make any amendments that you're hearing based on their feedback and repropose um, to the group. And then once you have your new proposal on the, on the floor, you still open up another round for if people have any objections and you integrate those objections. So you go back up to amending if something comes up to make it even stronger and then ask again, are there any objections? And once you hear no objections, then you can confirm that you've reached consent by having everyone, you know, come off mute or go in a circle and say, I consent. And when you consent, now you can celebrate because you have made a decision. Um, something to keep in mind with this process is creating like, trying to create a catch all proposal will make it a lot harder to get to consent. So try to get in the practice of more incremental decision-making and staying focused on what's on the table right now, but also creating space for if additional decisions need to be made that maybe you didn't contemplate to revisit those at another time when folk have the opportunity to actually sit with it and come up with a proposal. Um, sometimes we can get carried away with amendments and trying to integrate all the objections and all the questions and comments. And then it becomes something that we don't even recognize anymore. We don't really understand and we didn't really get anywhere. So it's very important to practice this often and incrementally if you can. The other thing is when you make a decision, you have the ability to set a term and you should set a term for when you review it. Um, so that way, if folk are like, oh, I'm not so sure about this, I might try it or be willing to try it, but like, I don't know if I wanna to commit to this long-term, set a term that people are actually comfortable with. So that will be the point at which you review the decision and say, is this something you wanna continue with or do we wanna uh, refine it now that we have had a chance to see it in action? Um, so try your best to get to that yes, to get to that consent um, by again, coming up with things that are good enough for now and safe enough to try. Um, Nonviolent communication. This is something that many of you also may be familiar with, but if not, I want you to have a chance to um, know what this is, be able to practice it within your groups. And it's essentially a method of deepening relationships, uh, resolving conflicts and creating connections by increasing one's capacity to empathize with the experience and expression of human needs. 
Um, Nonviolent communication is something that a lot of mediators practice. Um, so, you know, community mediators, international mediators, um, resolving all, all types of conflict will utilize this practice. This particular model was developed by American psychologist Marshall Rosenberg, um, but it continues to take on new forms and continues to be taught around the world. So this is something that a lot of people um, in co-op space will have some exposure to um, and will potentially have training and be able to practice. So it's a great tool to have in your toolbox um, when working in your group. And so this quick little clip talks about how the nonviolent communication process actually works. So the model I want to talk about today is on nonviolent communication. And for this, there's just four easy steps. Start with the observation. And I'm asking folks to connect that to how we are feeling. And also reframing our relationship with um, feelings. Oftentimes, when we talk about this at the Gandhi Institute, that we are using Dr. Seuss book language when it comes to our emotions. Mad, bad, glad, sad, right? And there's a plethora of other words that we can use to substitute in about what's going on for us. And those are really indicating, again, how we are doing and it ties directly into the needs that are underlying that. So when it comes to our needs, what values are most important to us? And what are we, how are we contributing that into the world? Lastly, we talk about requests. So right now I've been doing a lot of talking. Let's say I'm getting a little thirsty and I might ask someone in the audience, do you mind if I have a glass of your water and have a little sip? And you might say no. You might have germs I don't want to share with you, right? Now, if I'm giving a true request, that means I have to be okay with your answer and honoring that the answer is a no. Otherwise, and very critically to make that difference, otherwise I've just made a demand of you, right? So it's really important to look at the language of that. Also, if I just take your water, that creates a different type of conflict there. Two other little points to, to uh, connect into this framework is that our feelings are, informa are informing us whether our needs, those values are being met or unmet, and that every action that we are taking is in an attempt to meet a need. So me being here right now presenting this um, and thinking of the needs that come up, my need for a uh, sense of meaning and purpose in my life, my need for belonging and feeling a part of a community, if those needs are being met, which they are right now, I might be feeling pretty happy, right? I feel like baby pictures everyone gets excited about. You can't go wrong, right? And let's say I'm running out of time and they cut off my mic and the lights go out. And um, my need for consideration, my need to be understood, those aren't met at that time. So maybe I'm looking a little like this. I think I perfected the eye roll by age two, right? So we can have these different emotions. We can have those also at the same time. We hear that, tears of joy. And so I want us, again, to just hone in and think about our relationship with um, emotions in a different way so that we can just see those as little indicators of how we are doing. Okay, so and that video is actually 10 minutes long, I think in total, but I wanted to share that particular clip um, to highlight how this process works. And so what she mentioned were the four uh, steps in the nonviolent communication process, which people often refer to as OFNR, um, which stands for observation. And that's basically what happened as if you were an outside observer looking in what took, what took place. Um, then the next is you have your feelings. So this is where you unpack what feelings came up for you as you were experiencing this. Again, it's helpful if you're present with your breath. It's helpful if you're aware of your triggers. So you can identify those feelings and be able to express them. Um, to whomever you need to communicate with. It's also important that you not 
use feeling language to do like evaluations or make assumptions or accusations. Um, so things like, I feel as though, or I feel like normally whatever follows that <laughs> is some type of assumption or accusation. So it's very important to remember that we're actually stating what we are personally experiencing in the moment um, without any value attachments to it. And then um, our needs are those intrinsic human needs that we all have um, that are not being met or that are being brought up by the situation. And then after you've stated your need, you have the opportunity, if you would like, to make a request. And this is where you ask something particular of the other person that will help you to better meet your needs. Now, what are those needs? Um, this particular model is called the Max Needs model, but uh, it highlights nine categories of human need, um, which are sustenance, safety, love, understanding and empathy, creativity, recreation, sense of belonging, autonomy, and meaning. Um, now, some of you may be more familiar with this model, which is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's taught in like many different disciplines and many different arenas. Um, but I stacked that list up um, from the Max Neef model with the um, hierarchy of needs pyramid so that you could see how it kind of compares. Um, but whichever framework you use, at the end of the day, human beings all have needs. And when those needs are not met, um, it could lead to us uh, sometimes, you know, experiencing conflict with each other, sometimes experiencing conflict within ourselves, or acting in ways that seem counterintuitive to our desires or our values. Um, some resources that I provided uh, for you all is, this is actually adapted from a tool that was created by Mickey Cashton, who is another person who's very well known in this nonviolent communication space and has developed a lot of resources over the years to support um, what they call giraffes or nonviolent communicators. Um, but you can go through this worksheet when you're unpacking a particular conflict and do it from the framework of yourself and what you're experiencing, but then also do it from the framework of the other person as well. So when you're engaging in dialogue, you should really take turns you know, speaking and hearing what the other person is saying. And if you don't have a chance to like speak to them prior, you know, in the moment, or you feel like maybe going through this process will be challenging, you can actually go through your side of the, the worksheet, um, you know, filling out all of the sections and have a friend or a colleague listen, and they'll be listening for the other person and what their observations, feelings, needs, or requests may be. Um, so that's another way that you can utilize this tool to help you build empathy and be able to engage conflict um, with others that you may experience it with. And then I also provided a list of feelings and needs in the resources. And this is really helpful because sometimes we just can't find the words. <laughs> we can't find the words to express what we're thinking, what we're feeling, or what's not being met. So things like a visual tool with a list of words can be helpful to kind of unpack what that is that's coming up for you. Um, now I did have built in an opportunity for us to actually practice this. Um, I didn't intend for us to do both because we, we would not have time to do that. Um, but you essentially have options, right? So this particular practice is designed for a smaller group or a pair of people. And in this practice, each person has five minutes to reflect and prepare an OFNR statement for a conflict that's relevant to them. Um, then the requester uh, would, would speak first and introduce whatever the conflict or issue is. And they would do so by reading out their offers, um, offers, feelings, needs, requests, or OFNR statement. Um, and then, the reflector who's listening 
will reflect back to them and say, what I hear you saying is as a way to kind of summarize the need or request that they're hearing from the person, or you can also include their feelings as well um, to further build that bridge of empathy. But once you confirm that your understanding is correct or they correct it, then you can respond, if you so choose again, with a way that you would like to offer to help meet that need or something that you can do in the future that will be more mindful of that person's need. Um, and then once you've done that, you can switch roles. So now the person who was reflecting can be the one making the request and the person who was requesting can be the one reflecting. Um, so this is a great way to work within like a group where there is more knowledge of each other and understanding of each other to be able to unpack things and you can create space for this um, within your meetings. You can create space with this, with, uh, for this within your retreats. Um, but this is a great tool to help you kind of engage with things in real time. Um, another practice, and this works better for groups where they're a bit larger and where people don't necessarily know each other as well. Um, but each person will take five minutes at the same time to reflect and prepare an OFNR statement based on a topic of their choosing. And once they prepare that statement, a volunteer will read it out loud to the group um, and provide any context that maybe isn't covered in their statement while everyone else listens. And they're taking notes to try to hear things like what feelings are coming up, what needs are coming up, what requests are coming up in the situation. And then any questions that they might have as well, because after that, um, they will have an opportunity to ask the volunteer any clarifying questions. Again, being careful that the questions are true questions and you're not trying to restate um, suggestions or opinions as questions, uh, but you're just trying to gain clarity. Once you gain clarity, then the group that listened will have about 10 minutes to discuss amongst themselves what they heard and how they might approach addressing that situation. Um, the person who originally shared just sits and listens, doesn't react. Um, and they're taking notes so that they can, um, you know, gain new insights or suggestions or things that they might be able to apply to the real life situation. And then once the group finishes their discussion, um, the person who originally spoke can then you know, provide any reactions or thoughts that they have about what was shared. And this particular practice is adapted from something that's called a consultancy protocol. And it's something that's used in, um, in academic spaces at times, but it's also used in community spaces. I was introduced to it through a community space and I thought it was great and would be helpful for nonviolent communication or just kind of practicing it and unpacking it in a large group of people. Um, so these are the two nonviolent communication practices uh, that I'm offering and recommending that you use both or either one within your group. Um, again, being mindful of time, I really want to have enough space for us to kind of just openly talk and maybe even unpack if uh, people feel so inclined. But the important thing is when a conflict arises, and harm occurs, we have to act. We have to get active in the moment. And um, for me, this is an acronym. Um, it stands for first acknowledging the harm, then collect any information about it. You know, what ha what occurred, what, whether it's those OFNR statements, um, interviewing the parties involved, incident reports, but just getting a sense of what transpired as best as you can and then from there, you want to have a time-bound action plan. You don't, don't linger on indefinitely. And you want to state what the deadline is. Like, we will respond to this within X amount of time. And in that time, you're creating that plan or you're doing a review of your policy. Um, normally, there's like some type of grievances committee or circle within your group who's responsible for doing this. Um, and then once you kind of have a plan in mind for how you're going to deal with the situation, then you intervene. And that intervention could be a conversation, uh, it could be a mediation, and depending upon the severity of the harm, it could also be corrective action as well. Um, but it's very important that you do intervene, you are thoughtful about the intervention, and that it's appropriate for the circumstance at hand. Um, 
And once you've had your moment to address the situation, you want to verbalize what your next steps are and any desired outcomes. So what is it that you hope to accomplish by addressing this conflict? What do you hope will happen going forward that maybe didn't in the moment when the situation occurred? And um, what will it look like if you have effectively addressed the situation? How will your organization change? How will your organization improve? And write those things down and say those things um, at the conclusion of whatever intervention practice you choose. Because now you're gonna also take time to evaluate that impact over time. So whatever those stated desired outcomes are, whatever those next steps are, take time to check in, um, check in with all the parties involved, um, ask for follow-up, ask for feedback so that you know how the intervention ultimately unfolded over time. Was it effective? Was it helpful? Would you do something different in the future? Um, you could even do a feedback survey about how the conversation or the mediation went, but these are ways to ensure that we are constantly learning and growing in how we practice conflict together. There are other models out there. Um, this is just one that kind of, for me, embodies a lot of the things I shared tonight. But um, there's also something called the Claire Method that you might be familiar with. Um, and this information is in the In It Together resource that I spoke about earlier. So we touched on a lot tonight. Um, I don't expect you to retain all of this if it's new information for you, especially. Um, but there are a few key things that I do want you to take away. Um, namely, that conflict is a need not being met. And this need could be internal. It could be relational and it could be conscious or unconscious. I also want you to walk away knowing what the five conflict responses are and how they may or may not relate to trauma responses, depending upon your personal relationship to conflict. Um, so competing could look like fighting or accommodating could look like fawning. Avoiding could be flight or freeze. Uh, compromising, depending on how much you're compromising, could kind of be a little bit of fawning. But collaborating as you notice, doesn't have anything parentheses next to it because if you remember that chart, collaborating was the most cooperative and the most assertive way of addressing conflict. So in cooperation, if you're trying to affirm those principles and those values, right, um, keep that in mind. If you can collaborate or at least compromise, you're moving in the right direction towards cooperation. Um, Conflict sources and practices. At the end of the day, they boil down to three main areas. It's either communication, behavior, or beliefs that's fueling either that source of conflict or that is undergirding that practice that you're looking to engage in. Um, and integrative consent is a way um, that we can practice working with conflict or tensions or things that are emerging. Um, as we're, you know, wrestling with ideas or fielding proposals or trying to make decisions. Um, so this is just one practice that allows us rather than to avoid conflict or compete with each other, work together to get to something that we all can get into agreement with. Um, the nonviolent communication is a way to kind of unpack and have a conversation where we're centering feelings and needs and not accusing each other of things, not attacking each other, um, but trying to keep it to the facts and our feelings and our needs, and then making requests, understanding that it's still a request. So the person does not have to um, do what you're requesting, but you're giving them the opportunity at least to know and understand you better and, and be able to support you um, as they are capable. We also talked about the nine categories of human need. Um, I won't read them all out here, but um, those human needs are often at the root of whatever we might be feeling in the moment um, when we're experiencing conflict or when we're being triggered um, in a conflict situation. But it's very important to remember that when harm occurs, because it will happen, unfortunately, sometimes um, within our groups that we are active, and really proactive in how we address it. Um, so next steps for you, review the slides and resources, share the information with at least three other people, 
who could use it, um, you know, continue to pay it forward. If you have any additional questions that maybe we don't get to tonight, um, feel free to book a free 30 minute consult with me and we can talk about it. If it's a particular conflict, you don't necessarily want to unpack on the call. Um, let's make time to have that conversation, but have grace with yourself and each other as you're integrating, practicing, and applying what you're learning. That applies to what you learned tonight, but that applies to things that you'll learn going forward, working with each other. So um, since we didn't do our practices in the interest of time, I do want to do a little bit of a robust checkout round. Um, so I wanna hear from the folk on the call, how you were feeling leaving the space. What's one thing you heard or saw that stuck with you? What's one tool, practice, or task that you're taking with you? And what's one question that you either want to keep exploring now or exploring after uh, the session tonight? So you can answer all three of these if you would like, again, since we have a bit of time. Um, but I really want to hear from you all what you're feeling and thinking at this moment. So with that, I will return to our attendance roll. And there may or may not be a couple of people who didn't make it on here. If you're not on here, um, you can chime in at the end, uh, but starting with Anita, would like to hear from you, um, your check out if you can. Anita, are you speaking? Can you hear, oh. can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so I'm feeling, well, tired's the obvious one, but um, it was really, really good um, and quite timely, actually, this uh, session. So in terms of one, there's not one thing that I <laughs> heard or saw that stuck me, with me, but of course, the, you know, the fight, fight, we kind of tend to say fight or flight and then miss out the, the freeze and especially the fawn side of that um, response. Um, I'm, so I was really interested in uh, how what that looks like in working relationships in different ways. So I'm, I, I feel quite familiar with it in terms of within kind of family dynamics. And I guess in some ways, you know, family as a, your immediate community, then the circles out of that. There's, I think there's lots of similarities. So I'm interested in also how leadership shows up. So different um, roles within um a group or something and how sometimes that can affect um well the kind of power dynamics so just in general I'm kind of looking at some of the the, the examples that you showed and thinking about them in relation to some other reading that I've been doing about power in general and um and also in collaborations as well not not just say for example in your own organization or co-op or group but when you collaborate with different organizations on initiatives, um, how power moves and how you might use some of these, um, the tools that you shared in different situations as a way to work through things or prevent things. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, out of curiosity, Anita, what are some of the things you're reading about power? So uh, a woman called Julie Diamond, um, she has a coaching practice, I forgot what it's called, something like Diamond Power um, practice, and, and her work's really interesting. Um, so very much about how we, how power works, how it moves, how, it sh how we use it or misuse it, and how different, how we interpret different things based on particularly what are ro uh, different roles um, within um, organisations. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And if you have any resources related to um, what you've been reading or learning and, and you want to add them to the chat, I'm sure yeah. everyone benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Cool. All Thanks. right, who's next on our attendance roll? I have Antonisha. Um. It's a lot, but what sticks out more because of the dynamics in Syracuse is when it comes to cooperation and just coming together to build something that um, 
will benefit the community, um, like the conflict, like learning how to deal with conflict, um, how to communicate because people don't really, it's like they don't want to deal with it. If something arises, it just immediately just remove themselves from the group. They mm -hmm. don't, won't discuss anything. They won't respond to emails or like, it's like, how do a person know if they said something that offended you or maybe they didn't say anything offended you. You just didn't want to be a part of like, there's no follow up. There's no nothing. So it's like, how, how do we work through like conflict? And, and so that practice active is something I really want to like look more into, read more into of how to deal with community conflict. Thank you for sharing, Tanisha. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next we have Carolyn. Hi, I'm feeling far more relaxed than at the beginning of the session. I was the good tired one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the one thing, the exercise that we did where we had to uh, score one to five in terms of of um, how we rated ourselves. I had to chuckle at some of them because I thought, hmm. uh, just earlier today, I, I felt as though I, I had to defend my position on something. And um, hopefully I, I did it in a constructive way. And actually it made me pause just now. And, and I just... I wrote down a note that I'm going to send to a person to say, you know, I've got to have a delayed processing on something. So um, I, uh, I I think I'm going to revisit that that document that we uh, used because it did make me kind of reflect on. I think even my perception of how I come across to some people sometimes in terms of how I respond in situations when I'm passionate about my position on it, mm -hmm. that um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can temper myself, but I'll try. <laughs> but I do, I feel much better now than I did uh, early in terms of being more relaxed. So... Mm -hmm. With that, I'm going to pass the mic to James. Hi. Yeah, I think I'm, I I was feeling tired earlier. Definitely um, became a lot more energized as the presentation went. Um, really enjoyed the content that you shared with us. Um, taking, like, took away a lot. You know, I think just the practical tools. Um or just like um, framework that you had around the nonviolent communication, like the two practices. I thought that was so usable. Um, when I just think about, yeah, just conflict in, in the work, workplace. Um, I work at Boston Juma Project. I'm the chief of staff. And part of my work is like organizational development um, and culture and, um, you know, conflict emerges. And I think I really appreciated um, the acronym that you shared with us was it active. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I feel like it just gave such a great sort of sequencing of like steps for all uh, in response to conflict. Um, that that I think our team can consider, um, or we can like put in place in our own way. Um, now that you know we become a an official organization, so like I think these are these are offerings that I know will be really, really helpful as we grow. And so just really grateful for that. Um, I'm going to pass it to Joanna. Joanna, are you still here? Joanna Dorsey? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the next person is Joshua 
And then if Joanna can join us later, we'll bring you back into the queue. All right, Joshua. Yeah. Uh, again, thanks so much, Amber, for this for this uh, lesson and kind of sharing all that you provided. This is really helpful. I think it's important to to know and keep in mind whether you're in a cooperative or not. Just working with a group of people, um, trying to understand like the nuance of how we can collectively um, address issues and move forward is really is really important. Um, don't be redundant. I kind of echo everything I've heard so far, particularly from James. Um, but something that I really felt that was affirming um, from what you shared was just the acknowledgement of trauma and how trauma can come sometimes interfere with um, conflict and conflict resolution and making decisions collectively. And I think you provided like a nice set of like steps to kind of address and navigate um, dealing with people's traumas and how they show up in the workspace or in the collective. So again, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kendra. I'll jump in instead of Kendra because it looks like she put in the chat that she had to do her son's um, routine. Thank you. Um, so Karita, uh, but what I think I focused the most on was the idea of conflict as a positive. Um, and I can tell you all that Carolyn uh, went toe to toe with an elected official who's running on the national or the, the state stage, who's a local official um, today. And it was lovely to watch. So. Uh, she doesn't really need to reframe the way she approaches things. Thank you for sharing, Karita. Thank you, Karita. Uh, next, we have Marcia. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, I am very, very, very interested in conflict resolution. I've, uh, I already knew my style, uh, which is definitely the avoidance one. And so I'm taking that away that I haven't uh, changed my style like I thought I had. And that um, each day I'm gonna question myself uh, as to whether I was operating out of my feelings, my personal narratives, uh, familiarity, or was I operating out of understanding? Because moving forward, in order for me to do the work that I want to do, I need to uh, be ready. And sometimes I kind of have an attitude problem. So I'm working on it. So thanks <laughs> for the well, lesson. We'll figure out how to solve it. Let the rest of us know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank but, you, yeah, you gave me something, you gave me an assignment to keep doing. Thank mm. you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have Marie, and I think you have someone else with you as well, right? Yeah, this is uh, Marie and Doris. Yes. Um, one thing that um, the one thing that stuck with us is um, the root of all conflict. I think keeping that in our in you know in our consciousness as we communicate and talk with other people, um, it'll. I think that. Keeping that in the in the back of our processing, I think helps with the notion of compassion that we can hold for people when we're talking with them and communicating. Um, in terms of the tool, the tool to uh, take with us, I think the self the self assessment tools that you gave the fifteen questions, but more importantly, the trauma journaling. Um, uh, my thing now is compassion and benevolence. So, you know, just being able to uh, know. And be conscious of my traumas, just as opposed to yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that happened back, you know, when I was three or whatever. But realizing, as I'm thinking back on those trigger, those trigger moments that I've had that were highly embarrassing, it was because there was a trauma event. And bringing that into my consciousness and working with that and being aware of it as I communicate, I think will help me a lot. And then um, in terms of keep asking questions, I know for me, it's all about language. I'm very scientific. I'm very numbers oriented. So having these more qualitative language in terms of communicating with people, I got to really work with those models. Um, I've done that, that second, the second way that you talk about nonviolent communication. 
I've done that before under the guise of peer counseling or peer coaching. Mm-hmm. And um, I do know that that works very well. And whoever participates, you expand as you work in, inside that group. So nonviolent communication is what I'm going to really be focusing on. Thank you. And then I don't know. If- and I'll pass it to Naima. Yeah. Thank you. I am sorry. I did miss the prompt. I have a lot of noise. Um, um, I did want to say that I appreciate the mention of the nonviolent communication. I have done training in that, and it's always um, it's always something I want to implement in in new areas. Mm-hmm. You feel complete. Um, the next person is Paulette. I really enjoyed um, the presentation and it was interesting because I heard things in a way that I don't know that I think I heard them before. And in when you were saying about in conflict, sometimes it's the needs of the person in front of you have not been met. And I thought, oh, never thought of it like that. I thought they might be cantankerous or something, but that was quite interesting. And um, there was... There was a, uh, when you said that somebody <clears throat> can actually, you can make the request, but they can say no. I never actually thought of that. I never, I don't know, probably because I'm very uh, forthright. I would just get, yeah, I need that done. I need it done now. Not that they have the, oh, they can have the option. So it was, it was just very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and expressing your truth. Um, next, we have Ramona. Yes, what I um, I like the the self assessment to see if I'd grown, um, went backwards, stayed the same. So I like doing that. I also like what Marie and Dora said. Um, since one person was speaking for the both of them <laughs> about compassion, I like that. And what um, Paulette just said, I had a particular, I supervised caseworkers um, with defects in the state of Georgia. And I had, a, um, we had a child that needed to be picked up and I had given instructions to the caseworker, you know, when I needed her to go pick up the child because she really, the child really wasn't um, supposed to be where she was. And she kept delaying it and it took me and I don't know why and I'm thinking maybe it, it might have been some of what Marie and Doris said about compassion maybe as a supervisor I wasn't compassionate enough to realize the caseworker was scared and then it just flashed across me and I told her I said come on we're going to get this child and it was like, that's what she needed. She didn't know how to tell me that she was either reluctant, afraid, or, or whatever. We had dis- thoroughly discussed the case, and the child definitely, legally, not supposed to be where she was. And so that, um, when Ma- Marie was discussing that about uh, compassion, and Paulette was saying somebody in front of you could be um, the issue that they're having, may have nothing to do with you. It may be having something to do with a past trauma and that's what they're dealing with. And I felt like that's what she was dealing with, a past trauma. But as soon as I was able to support her, it was like, wow, it it was like another person. Mm -hmm. Although I had to call the police. But anyway, we handled it. Everything was smooth. The child got picked up and, um, and all that. So it really tonight's session kind of brought back some of those memories um and then the fight and flight i didn't know there were two more things freeze and fawn Mm -hmm. so it's been a minute since i've gone through some mediation training and whatnot we mostly talked about fight or flight so what i want to continue to look up and um, become more familiar with this freeze and find because I think that's what I've been seeing in some other people's um, behaviors. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I'm gonna, I I had um, PDF the slides, but I'm gonna reshare it in a way that the links actually work. <laughs> So you can refer to the resources um, where it talks about the four trauma responses. Um, Tamika, I think is next. Hi, um, yes. Uh, so um, I think just tonight um, there is a lot to unpack for me <laughs> and to think more about. Um, I really liked, um, uh, taking that that test, um, I think you were. You know, I mean, the discussions around power dynamics, um, and then taking the test for me kind of brought up some things. I'm actually having a lot of conversations with people about communication, and um, you know, I think some of me realizing that um, perhaps my default is trying to get to a happy medium, knowing that I'm going to overcompensate for the other person's unwillingness to negotiate or to meet me halfway. Um, and so I feel like um, some of, sometimes my responses to knowing that may end up in more aggressive uh, back and forth when I feel, when I feel like I understand that the person isn't willing to um, really consider what my needs are. So, yeah, I, I think this is brought, a lot of that up for me and just I'm interested in kind of continuing to think more about my communication its impact on other people and also what my line is uh, to make sure that my needs are met um, and that I'm not trying to pour from an empty cup mm, Asha. thank you Tamika for sharing mm -hmm. uh, next okay. we have Deborah okay Deborah uh, yes, I knew that this was for me, <laughs> this session. Uh, ironically, we are going through this process. Uh, we have hired an, me, a mediator. I have taken the assessment um, uh, test. All of us have taken the assessment. And uh, we are waiting to uh, come together to find out the results or to, to discuss the results. Uh, we have been discussing a retreat for the last year. And um, this is what we have uh, come, uh, come to the point that we need conflict resolution. Okay. And I can now see that um, where, how I need to approach the, um, the uh, retreat. Uh, mm -hmm. as far with the OFNR, very helpful, very helpful. I'm going to be using that to fill in a couple of uh, uh, questions and proposals and why they are, my needs are not being met and why I feel so much conflict uh, within me and moving at the pace of trust. Uh, that has been one of my primary concerns is um, being able to trust. Um, yeah, I just leave it like that, being able to trust. And it's okay. And that this, what we're going through now is okay. That is a part of uh, building uh, relationships. And I think that once we uh, have this, as a matter of fact, I even called the person, <laughs> I called the person that's in charge of the retreat and tell them where are we in that process? We need to hurry up, you know, and get this thing going. And especially now that I, I see where it's going and what she want mm -hmm. us to do with um, the assessment that we all took. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Zavora. And I just want to highlight that you brought up some additional practices that are helpful bringing in the third party. Very important especially if you want to ensure that your needs are being met in the conversation too. You don't want to have to facilitate and be a member when you're going through a conflict uh, transformation or resolution process, because then you kind of have to put your needs to the back burner to make sure the group's needs are being met. So working with mediators, and there are many free community mediators that you can find and access out there just by Googling community mediation in your town. 
Um, but I highly recommend that as well as retreats. And it sounds like your mediator gave you an assessment as well. So that's really great to hear. Um, next, we have Denise. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So the creative team that I work with is made up of a set of, a set of really com confident and dynamic personalities. Um, and there's a mix of like siblings and friends, which presents some presents with some sort of fiery dynamics at times because of the familiarity. So we did have a team conduct agreement, which I'm now I'm going to re revisit the um, materials from this evening and I'm going to you know, try and use them at the next team meeting. Um, well, arrange a spe specific, you know, meeting sort of. Um, to get them to do the assessment sheet and review our review our conduct agreement because we've had some quite fiery conversations and I've struggled really to get them to sort of engage with each other differently. Um, so yeah, so I'm taking away also the idea of embracing and making best use of the conflict and the idea of it being an unmet need. So I feel like the assessment sheet is going to be really helpful. So yeah, so thank you. It's been really, really good. And I'll pass to Rick. Rick? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I uh, I feel calmer mostly because, Amber, you have a very calming voice and demeanor. And uh, so that's helpful. And then um, what struck me was what you said when about if a if an organization is not having conflict, then what is it doing? Like it's not getting anything done. I hadn't thought about it that way, um, but it makes a lot of sense. And um, I, the active framework I think is quite, uh, was quite helpful and compelling. Um, and what I'm wondering at the end was the self-assessment, uh, is it ever, uh, do you, ever do a self-assessment and then have someone else like people you work with or your family assess you also <laughs> so i don't know if they would have the same answers i would have about yes. how i handle conflict yes and i'm so glad you said that um because i should have said that as well one of the great things about these assessments um particularly the self-assessment is you can share it with people that are closest to you and if you really, really want to do some transformation work, you know, get that feedback. And then, like, if something is contradicting what you said about yourself, have a conversation to, like, really understand how people see you better or experience you better. And that could lead to some major transformational healing work. So I thank you for bringing that up. And I highly encourage people to share it with others and ask them to fill it out on their behalf as well. Um, all right. So if anyone didn't, I, I know we're at time, um, and we did start a little bit later, so hopefully we got a little grace, but if anyone didn't get to speak, I would love to hear from you as well, including any of the moderators. Um, anyone, did you have anything to share? Yeah. All right. Hello. So this is Annette, and, uh, I apologize. I missed a lot of it. I was in another meeting. Um, but the part that I feel like stuck out to me was that um, sometimes conflict is really based on people trauma. And if you, and sometimes if when people aren't ready to deal with it, it'll show up. And for me, <laughs> for me, um, I call people out on their stuff and people aren't always ready for that. Uh, so I've been working through, well, sometimes I just tell people that they stuff is stupid. Um, and that's probably not the way to do it either. Um, but it's like working with others to work through. And it doesn't have to be done at the pace that I feel it should be done. <laughs> that people have to do it in their own span of time and um, this is something I share though too anywhere in our life that we have felt out of control if somebody tries to control that area 
there is no control because that person wants to keep control because they they have felt out of control in that space. So that's even something I learned about myself. Um, and it's it's work. It's continual work, no matter what. Thank you for sharing that. That was very powerful. Any area where we felt out of control, we will always struggle to relinquish control. Mm. I'm gonna remember that. Well, um, I do want to thank you all once again for sharing, being honest, being transparent. Oops, I progressed the wrong way. Um, <laughs> but I, before you all um, depart tonight, I would really, really, really appreciate if you could do the survey. Um, oh, what did I just click? My bad. Okay. If you all could do the survey, I am a entrepreneur who is building my consulting business. So any feedback that you offer about this session um, really, really helps me um, and helps NDCC as well. So what you share, um, you know, at least your results, if you don't want your name attached to your responses, that's fine. But your results, I'll be sharing with NDCC as well so that they can learn from it too. Uh, but I just want to thank you all so much for spending this time with me tonight, for spending this time with yourselves and with each other and, you know, continue on this journey. We can only go up from here. Thank you, Amber. Um, well, folks, we have another session coming up next week. Um, and uh, take time to complete the survey that Amber provided you, as well as the survey that 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 we provided as well. I look forward to seeing you all next week. And um, got some got a little ask of you, but I'll ask it next week. Amber, again, thank you uh, for your spirit, which you do things well appreciated. So with that said, everybody have a good evening. For my folks in England, get some rest. And I'll talk with you all later.